Tech Sags Live, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers in the Rollo Insurance Studio. Let's go to the Boss Firearms Hotline. It is SEC Mike. Michael Bratton joining us here on Tech Sags Live. Michael, good morning, buddy. Hey, good morning, David. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on the show. So, hey, I wanted to start things off with an obvious topic. a and um, the, the game against Notre Dame, there's two things that are battling at the same time. There's a part that is like, dude, Notre Dame's defense is legit and Connor struggled, right? No doubt about it. Uh, but you can build on that. And then there's the other side of the equation is how many times is this program going to be at the end of games with a chance to win and not find the ways to make the plays? So what was your assessment of the whole weekend against Notre Dame? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, there's a lot to be said there, obviously. Like you said, Wigman didn't look very good at all. Uh, now, he came out looking pretty strong, I thought. He drove right down the field. and there was, I get it. You you lose by double digits. We we are getting asked: Is Mike Elko even a worthy coach? I mean, people people are going overboard after one week. I, I'm not going anywhere near that. But just I think the main takeaway for me is I have never in my life have I watched Notre Dame look like it has better athletes than an SEC team that it's going up against. And I I think that's the biggest takeaway: is where where are all these athletes for A and M? I I saw no separation from virtually any receivers. That's not, that's not on Wigman, but quite honestly, David, I was surprised that they didn't bench him. And I'm not saying, you know, take, he's not the starter anymore. I'm not saying don't let him finish the game, but maybe for a series or two, like let him sit on the sidelines, read from, you know, talk to the coaches, do something. They, They had to mix something up and they just didn't. And I, it, clearly, it looked like the head coach lost confidence in, in, in Connor throwing the football. We all have seen the clip, I assume. And I think the offensive coordinator lost confidence in, in the Aggies' ability to block anybody and run the ball. So it was just a calamity on the offensive side of the football. So when you say that lost by 10, yes, but it was a tie game with a minute 50, right? So in, in, it was desperation. I guess my issue with the way the game ended was that final series, the final real series, right? They just weren't on the same page. That being said, I give them a little grace because it had been a year. And I know Riley Leonard has been a year, too. So, and Riley Leonard looked solid, no doubt about that. And I also think the Notre Dame game plan was fantastic. But you're not going to learn too much about AM this week, but is there something against McNeese that Connor can do to make you be like, all right, that's the guy that I saw last year? I mean, he's just got to look a lot more comfortable in this offense. I, he outside of the first drive or two, I mean, it it just didn't seem he was at all comfortable. I, I think he was seeing ghosts back there in the second half, particularly. Uh, you know, we, we got to see some of these. I want to see explosive plays. I don't recall a single explosive play that wasn't called back by penalty uh, against Notre Dame. So again, may, may, that probably says a lot more about Notre Dame than anything, but uh, th- this should be a, a shellacking. I want to see some of these other backup quarterbacks and and just see what they look like in this offense. All right, let's talk about the uh, big game this week in Michigan and Texas. The, m- my heart wants, you know, obviously for Michigan to win. I, I think it'd be an interesting story with what has happened there over the last year. Your offense is kind of revamped. Your defense should still be p- pretty good. Texas is good, though, man. How, how do you see this one go? Yeah, I I don't even think Michigan gets to 10 points based on what I saw from them last weekend and what I saw from Texas defense. I think I was more impressed. Everybody's, you know, talking up Quinn Ewers, Arch Manning, which they looked fantastic, by the way. But I'm more impressed by the Texas defense in that opener against Colorado State because I was told they've got a really good quarterback. They got a good receiver. They they did nothing. They didn't even get 100 passing yards on Texas last week. So, uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> we all know Michigan and how they cheat their way to victory. Well, they can cheat all they want. I don't think they're going to go close to Texas. And and I'll tell you this, David, I, I think the SEC needs this one pretty badly. And I, I have said this. You know, this is all guesswork with this 12-team committee. We've never actually seen it play out. But if Texas loses to, uh, on Saturday, I think it's going to cost the SEC a playoff spot. And I'm not saying it's going to cost Texas a spot, but the perception, I think, will be that the SEC is not as dominant as it was after week one and after this weekend. Would you believe that if Texas were to lose this game, that the SEC has lost ground? Yeah, I mean, because this would be two years in a row. Last season was an embarrassment in the non-conference as well. And then Georgia not making the playoff, of course, because of Alabama. But then Alabama goes and loses in the playoff to Michigan. 
I mean, I, th I think there would be a case to be made for that. Talking to SEC Mike here on the Boss Firearms Hotline. Mike, let's talk about Tennessee and NC State. I Look, I am not impressed with NC State. I know that people like them, uh, I, but I am impressed with Nico in Tennessee. Yeah, well, <laughs> you should be because they're going to destroy NC State here. I'll say, I, I got it 42 to 17. I mean, I don't even think this game's going to be close. Uh, again, it, you're right. Everybody leads off with Nico when they talk about Tennessee, as they should. I mean, he, the guy looks phenomenal. But the secret to Tennessee's offense, and shouldn't be a secret because they, they've been doing it since Hypo got there, but they run the ball as well as anybody. So that's just having Nico is just going to open that up even more. Uh, Tennessee had 300 rushing yards last week, uh, in addition to Nico just setting the all time Tennessee record for, for passing yards and a half. So, again, are they going to do that against NC State? They're not going to do that because it's competition is significantly tougher, but uh, I, I think Tennessee's defensive front is going to be all over Grayson McCall, the NC State quarterback. I don't think they have a prayer in this matchup. Mike, let's talk about this Oklahoma-Houston game. Had Houston looked better last week, I'd be more impressed with this game. I thought Oklahoma looked really good. There were some protection issues, but uh, do you even see this one being close at all? No, and I do enjoy the fact, you know, as we're getting to know more and more about Oklahoma, I'm sure your audience is a little, much more familiar with Oklahoma fans than I am, but with them coming to the SEC, they're winning by 50 points, and all I'm hearing is, oh, God, we can't convert a third down. <laughs> this offensive line ain't it. I'm like, my God, you, you won by half a hundred. You know what I mean? Th these are issues that are going to occur week one. So I, I actually, I love the fact that they're so picky and they have such a high standard, but I think they get a lot of that cleaned up, even with some offense alignment out. So yeah, I think you're dead on. I think Oklahoma rolls here too. Hey, I want to go through the rest of the SEC here in a minute, but something you said earlier about some of the feedback you were getting on Elko, Game 1, a and was that from A&M fans that were like, I don't, or was that just SEC fans in general? I'm curious because it's, it's interesting how any SEC fan or college football fan, like, Within 24 hours of a game, their emotions are at a different level <laughs> than maybe on the Wednesday and the Thursday after. You know, I, quite honestly with you, David, I think it's mostly Texas fans. And I, and I think it's because that, that's what they want. They want A&M to be a bust and Elko to not be a good coach. But uh, <laughs> I think they're a little bit of afraid that uh, A&M finally has a quality coach that can lead the program in the right direction. But I, again, I've, I've said it before. I think I've said it on this program. His success is going to be defined by his offensive coordinator hires. And I, I'm not ready to throw Colin Klein out by any means, but um, sh very shaky debut, I thought, for the offensive coordinator. Again, it's week one. Get back to me in a month. If we're, if we're still having these issues, then we got a real problem. By the way, can you remind me, if you've memorized it, because I have, but I just want you to remind me on the air, what Sark's record was in his first year as a coach at Texas. Oh, by the way, in the Big 12. I believe it was 5-7, and seven, David. That is correct. Okay. Just, I just wanted to make sure. And, hey, he has proved, like, last year they had a great year, and they have been able to build something in the Big 12, by the way. So when they got to the SEC, they would be legit. So, But that was with a Big 12 schedule. All right, we'll move on. Are you surprised by what happened with LSU and USC? Like, I mean, they've lost five in a row openers, right? But I, I, st I thought this was the year that came to an end. Yeah, quite honestly, I'm not. I, I've been down on LSU. I don't, I don't know why anyone had them as a possible playoff team. I think I voted them ninth in my SEC media poll. Of course, you know, without divisions, it's a little trickier. But, yeah, I mean, I, I just never got any of the LSU hype. I did pick them to win that game, so, I, you know, I'll be honest with that. But I just thought Lincoln Riley all this time to prepare going up this LSU defense, I thought they would kind of have their way with them. And it, it wasn't quite to that nature. Credit LSU's defense. They looked a heck of a lot better than they did last season, that, yet they still lost the game. Uh, I, what really surprised me, though, after the game, Brian Kelly basically threw his quarterback under the bus, which I thought was totally unfair. I thought Garrett Nussmeyer did look pretty good. He just didn't make the plays. I, I mean, him and Miller Moss, I thought, played the same game. But Miller Moss made a couple plays down the stretch, and it was really those Southern Cal receivers making some incredible catches that made Miller Moss look a little bit better. Um, I, again, I, at quarterback, they're all right, but the LSU's real issue is they have no running game. And I have no idea why people thought they would. The last two years, their running game was essentially Jane Dales and nothing else. Now they, they clearly don't have that. And I, I think it's going to be a real issue for them all season long. 
You think Arkansas is going to have success moving the ball against Oklahoma State? I do, but the problem is I think Oklahoma State's going to move the ball at will on Arkansas. Oklahoma State's got 10 senior starters just on offense, and that doesn't include their dynamic running back, Ollie Gordon, who some people have as a Heisman candidate, scored, I believe, 21 touchdowns last season. So uh, I think it's going to be a high-scoring game, but I, I just don't know how many stops Arkansas gets in this atmosphere. I, I like Oklahoma State to, to win and cover. Bobby Petrino's the truth, though, isn't he? Like, I mean, look, I'm not going to read too much into that offense last week, but the guy, when, you, when, when he's allowed to be the offensive coordinator, can coordinate the offense. No doubt. And, and I really like Taylor Green. Everything yeah. that I heard about him in the offseason, I thought, you know, it, again, the competition, like you said, was awful, but it was kind of verified. If he goes on the road and beats Oklahoma State this week, I think we need to give Taylor Green a ton of respect, too. He's, he's, your audience may not like this, but I, I see a little Vince Young in, in him. I'm, I'm not saying he's, you know, one of the best quarterbacks in, in recent college football history, but I see a little bit of that in him. Mike. You might have picked this. I don't know. I don't remember what you said last week. But, Vandy, did you see that coming? I thought they would cover, but I didn't think they'd win the game. How about Dago Pavian and Clark Lee? You know, David, they're, they're over under win total was two and a half. They may get that in the first three weeks of the season if they can go on the road and, and beat Georgia State next weekend. So, yeah, I I love it for Vanderbilt because it's so bad for this conference that they are essentially a bye week. For anybody that plays them, they this is what we I want Vanderbilt to be a pesky team, a fun team. Yeah, they're probably not going to win the vast majority of their conference games, but sneak up and beat a Kentucky, a, a South Carolina. Heck, qu quite honestly, they've beaten Tennessee more times than I care to remember. So that's what Vanderbilt should be. That's what we got last weekend, and uh, I couldn't be happier for them. We do have an all SEC match in week two. I'm looking forward to seeing South Carolina and Kentucky. Uh, I'm interested to see Mark Stoops after the aftermath of what happened here. And I, he's, an, he's a really good coach. There's no doubt about it. I'm, I'm curious. He, he might be kind of like Elko in the fact that, depending on his offensive coordinator, his team goes. Right. And the problem with him is he's not been able to pick an offensive coordinator more times than not. So uh, does he have a good one in Bush Hamden? I don't know. Uh, Drake had an opportunity to hire him at Missouri, and he passed. And that, and that was with him on the staff. So uh, that remains to be seen. I, K Kentucky obviously looks very good in their opener. South Carolina did not. If that continues, Kentucky's going to blow them out. But I think we'll get a much better South Carolina performance this weekend. I think uh, I'm still I'm, I'm still on the fence on Kentucky offense and their new quarterback, Brock Vandegrift. He had some mistakes. He took a lot of hits, David, in in the opening. Way, way, way too many. And same thing could be said for South Carolina's quarterback, Sellers. He ran the ball 22 times. That's how many they needed him to run the ball against Old Dominion. These guys are not going to last in, in the SEC if they're taking these kind of hits. So I like Kentucky to win, but I think it's going to come down to the wire. I really do. Mike, I, I would have asked you this earlier, but I just saw our staff put some notes together. I did not know you had Vanderbilt above Texas A&M on your power rankings. And <laughs> before you give me your why, I'm just going to ask, that's as of what you saw in one week, not long-term projections. Am I right about understanding that? That's if, if Vanderbilt and Texas A&M met today on a neutral field, who am I taking? I, I'm riding with Diego Pavia. I mean, it, he's incredible. They just whooped Virginia Tech. They actually let Virginia Tech get back in that football game. But, yeah, it, it, that's that's just of today. I'm going to follow up with you in a couple of weeks just to make sure we're, <laughs> where we are. I just want to see, okay? I just I want to see where we are. Let's, uh, let's talk about Florida. Does Napier get out of, of September? <laughs> I mean, uh, I, I got a, uh, well, I shouldn't say, but I, I, I've got an interesting text that said, watch out for A&M. When A&M goes up there and beats them, th that'll be the end. So I, I really do think, uh, yeah, following recent comments, I'm sure you've seen it. I don't know if your audience has, but basically he called out the fan base and that that's just, it was already coming to an end, but that always expedites it. And I, I don't know a single Florida person that is excited about anything anymore other than they got this freshman, DJ Lagway. You know, the narrative, David, was so funny. They were like, well, if we fire him, we're going to lose this, this Lagway. They don't even care about that anymore. Just get Billy Napier out of here. Bring back Urban Meyer. Or they're, they're, they all think they can get Lane Kiffin. I think that's laughable. I don't think anybody realizes the college football calendar anymore. 
because Lane Kiffin is not going to leave a team that is likely headed to the college football playoff up and leave to go take the Florida job. That's nonsensical. So uh, Florida fans can dream about who they're going to. We're also getting I got hit with this question. Can they get Dan Lanning? <laughs> yeah, he passed. He passed out Alabama to take the Florida job. Florida does not hire big name coaches. They hire Jim McElwain, Billy Napier, and, and the guys they have like Spurrier and Urban Meyer. They were not big names when they even got them. So whoever they get next, it, it's not going to be a big name coach. I saw this on the boards, and I've asked about it this week, but I'll just throw out a name. What about Jimbo Fisher? <laughs> I wouldn't wish that on anybody, David. No, no, Jimbo, get away from this program. Uh, are you interested at all in seeing uh, DJ Lagway? He's from down the road here. We, we know his game, and A&M recruited him quite a bit. Uh, are you interested to see his game? Oh, yeah, I, I certainly. I'll be watching uh, what he does because I can't wait for him to uh, hit the portal and come back to Aggie land here in a couple months. Uh, I like the way you operate there, SEC Mike. Let's uh, uh, finish up with Kalen DeBoer. What, what you saw week one and what you expect to see the rest of the way. Yeah, I mean, I thought Alabama looked very impressive to the point to where you know, I'm not sitting here telling you they're the they're the best team in the SEC, but I think they they have the potential, and and I get it. They were playing Western Kentucky. T.J. Finley, you know, a lot of SEC fans will remember that name. He he played horribly, so I, I get all that. But uh, man, they were just so explosive. And again, it's this sounds crazy, but I I was calling the decaying dynasty because I th- I thought Nick Saban was over the hill. And, and it just looks like that program has been infused with energy and enthusiasm. And if they play like they did on Saturday, they're going to be a tough out. I think they can even beat Georgia in Tuscaloosa here in a couple of weeks if they continue to play up to this level. So, uh, so far, I mean, that looks like a home run hire. Did you just compare Nick Saban to the Jonathan Majors? Is that what you just did on the air? <laughs> I think I did, yeah. Nicely played, my friend. Great job, SEC Mike. Michael Bratton here on the Boss Firearms Hotline. Thanks so much, buddy. We'll talk soon. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. All right, man.